and welcome back to a brand new episode of Bible Reading and Coffee Drinking. Today, we're finishing up our series on Easter. So this is just part two of our two-part series on the story of Easter, and it's going to end with Resurrection Sunday. It's going to be glorious. Today, we're going to read the back half of Matthew 27, and then read the full chapter of Matthew 28, talking about the crucifixion, the resurrection, and this glorious weekend that we're celebrating right here on Easter. So stay tuned with me. I got a couple of questions at the end that I think you're going to like. Uh, We're going to talk about Easter today. Let's do this. All right, welcome to a brand new episode. Today is a, a special episode. It's part two of our Easter, Easter series, excuse me, and we're reading Matthew 27 and 28 today, part of 27, about half of 27, and the rest of 28. We're going to read that. We're going to talk about uh, the the story of Easter, uh, the what led up to it, the, the trial of Jesus, the crucifixion of Jesus, which today, as I'm recording this, is Good Friday, and then all, obviously we want to talk about resurrection Sunday and what happens after that. So that all that happens in Matthew 27 and 28. So we're going to read that today. We're going to talk about it. If you're watching or listening to this, make sure you stay tuned to the end. I got some good questions for you at the end. My audience always has good questions, uh, and I'll take a couple of those uh, after we get done reading. But um, in the meantime, make sure you check out the first episode of this series if you missed it. Uh, you can watch it on YouTube or Instagram or listen to it everywhere you find podcasts on Bible reading and coffee drinking. Uh, you can always go to livingchristian.org, which is my website. Uh, there it has all the all the old podcasts and videos and all sorts of stuff. So check that out. Let's have a sip of coffee, and we'll get started here with Matthew uh, 27. So if you're uh, reading along, we're going to skip the first kind of part of 27 where Judas hangs himself. Uh, spoiler alert, uh, Jews, Judas was uh, so racked with grief from selling out Jesus that he went and committed suicide, which is uh, obviously an example uh, showing the grief that leads to that, as well as kind of the coward's way out. But we're going to skip that, and we're going to jump right into the uh, trial of Jesus in front of Pontius Pilate. So uh, we're going to start Matthew 27, verse 11. S- sip of coffee, let's get going here. Now Jesus was standing before Pilate, the Roman governor. So Rome had control of uh, Jerusalem at the time, and uh, Pontius Pilate, or Pilate, was in charge of that area. Uh, Are you the king of the Jews, the governor asked him. Jesus Jesus replied, excuse me, you have said it. This is a typical way of Jesus kind of pushing the question back to people, like, hey, you said it, you know, uh, I am, I guess. Uh, Verse 12, but when the leading priest and the elders made these accusations against him, Jesus remained silent. Don't you hear all the charges that are bringing against you, Pilate demanded? But if Jesus made no response to any charges, much to the governor's surprise. Now it was a governor's custom each year during the Passover celebration to release one prisoner to the crowd, anyone they wanted. This year was the notorious prisoner, a man named Barabbas. Okay, so this guy was obviously a bad guy, and everybody knew who he was. And uh, it was that uh, he was the one that got chosen uh, for the swap here. As the crowds gathered before Pilate's house that morning, he asked them, which one do you want me to release, Barabbas or Jesus, who is the Messiah? He knew very well that the religious leaders would arrest Jesus out of envy. He called Jesus the Messiah on purpose. Whether Pilate believed that or not, right, um, he used it as a term to make sure he was riling up the Jewish uh, Pharisees and the religious leaders over there because they knew that that was kind of a, a crime, so to speak, against their religion. That was blasphemy in their religion. So he made sure he used that term. Uh, uh, verse 19. Just then, as Pilate was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him a message. Leave that innocent man alone. I suffered through a terrible nightmare about him last night. This is interesting to me that uh, Pilate's wife had a dream uh, about Jesus, uh, kind of showing her the future, or showing her what was going to happen and who he really was, um, which is weird how God would do that. Uh, but it's interesting how he uses people and the the most unlikely people in the most unlikely places uh, to share the truth, uh, which is really really cool. And that's you know we know that every day, all day in our lives, uh, that God does use all of us. And sometimes it's the most unlikely people to spread his news. 
All right, verse 20. Meanwhile, the leading priest and all the elders per, uh, persuaded the crowd to ask Barabbas to be released and for Jesus to be put to death. So the governor asked him, which of these two would you like me to release to you? The crowd shouted back, Barabbas. Pilate responded, then what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? They shouted back, crucify him. Why, Pilate demanded, what crime has he committed? But the mob roared even louder, crucify him. Pilate saw that this wasn't getting anywhere and that a riot was developing. So he sent for a bowl of water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood and the responsibility is yours. And all the people yelled back, we will take responsibility for his death, we and our children. So Pilate released Barabbas to them. He ordered Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip, then turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. So even Pilate realized and understood that Jesus hadn't technically broken any Roman laws, right? Um, so to punish him for uh, breaking a or being blasphemous towards religious law was not something that the Romans did at the time. It was just that was an odd part of the character. You know, he didn't want to be known as the guy who put Jesus to death if Jesus was the Messiah. His wife had already kind of instilled doubt in him on that uh, and curiosity with him on that. But it was also he knew that he didn't necessarily have the authority to do it. So he he pushed that responsibility onto the people, pushed it off to the religious sec, uh, section of the time and said, hey, you know what? This is y'all's responsibility. That's fine. I'll do it. But I'm only doing it because you asked me to. Now, he just wanted to keep the peace, right? That's part of the Roman governor, part of the Roman organization there was just trying to keep the peace. All right, let's move on to 27. Some of the governor's soldiers took Jesus into their headquarters and called out the entire regiment. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. They wove thorn branches into a crown and put it on his head, and they placed a reed stick in his right hand as a scepter. Then he knelt before then they knelt before him in mockery and taunted Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him and grabbed the stick and struck him on the head with it. When they were finally tired of mocking him, they took off the robe and put on his own clothes on him again. Then they led him away to be crucified. So this is a very demeaning way, obviously, that they're treating Jesus Christ. Okay. Uh, this is the devil's work. Uh, and but they he's what Matthew's trying to do is give us a picture about kind of how brutal it is in those days uh, when they were flogging and taking care of. And this is a very short paragraph. Some of the other you know, books go into a little more detail, but uh, make no mistake, it, it was a, a treacherous, um, not just a flogging, but a they were really uh, tormenting and, and um, just absolutely brutalizing Jesus Christ. Um, so now we move along to the crucifixion. Along the way, they came across a man named Simon, uh, who was from uh, Cyrene, and the soldiers forced him to carry Jesus' cross. And then they went to the place called um, ooh, Go uh, Golgothine, I, I always mispronounce that, Golgotha, which means place of the skull. The soldiers gave uh, Jesus wine mixed with bitter gall, which, made, uh, which when he tasted, he refused to drink it. So this is where they're taking him up to Calvary's cross, up to that hill outside of Jerusalem. Uh, that's what the place of the skull is referencing, and they're ready to crucify him. Verse 35, after they nailed him to the cross, the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice, showing all this sinful behavior. Uh, he's doing that on purpose to show that these people were not people of God. Then they sat around and kept guard as he hung there. A sign was fashioned above Jesus' head, announcing the charge against him. It read, this is Jesus, King of the Jews. Two revolutionaries were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. The people passing by shouted abuse, shaking their heads in mockery. Look at you now, they yelled at him. You said you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild in three days. Well then, if you're the son of God, save yourself and come down to the cross. They had no idea what was really going on here, obviously. They're mocking Jesus. They're they're beating Jesus. They're making fun of Jesus. They're even, like, he had mentioned that he would tear down the temple. What they didn't understand was the analogy of what he was talking about. Yes, the physical temple would be, uh, and, the, and the curtains would be torn, but the reality of it is he's talking about himself uh, being the temple of God and the fact that it would be destroyed and rebuilt 
in three days, but they don't understand that. They're stuck in their sin. They're stuck in their perspective. They're stuck on not understanding and seeing the truth. It is pure evil that's happening right now. The leading priests, the teachers of religious law, and the elders also mock Jesus. He saved others, they scoffed, but he can't save himself. So he is the king of Israel, is he? Let him come down from the cross right now, and we will believe him. He trusted God, so let God rescue him if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. Even the revolutionaries who were crucified with him, ridiculed him in the same way. So even the religious people of the time were just absolutely brutal to him. Mm. And it also goes to show that just because you're a, a quote-unquote religious person, or even a religious leader, uh, for that matter, um, doesn't necessarily that you understand exactly what's going on. It doesn't, un- and certainly doesn't help you understand who Jesus was. You may know who he is. They knew Jesus, but they didn't know Jesus in their heart. Uh, and, and so be wary of that as well. All right, uh, verse 45, uh, the death of Jesus. At noon, darkness fell across the land uh, until three o'clock. It's funny. with the I talked about this in the last episode of the fact that there's so many numbers in the Bible that are uh, symbolic, right? And and the uh, the letter or the number three obviously is very symbolic. Talk about the <clears throat> temple being destroyed and being rebuilt in three days. Jonah and the fish, three days. You know all the ones we talked about in the last episode. But even in this one, the darkness fell at what time? Three o'clock. Uh, it all is foreshadowing the fact that Jesus was going to rise again on the third day. Uh, so it's it's amazing how the how God used the writers of the Bible throughout it to use these different numbers, right? Um, to use these different numbers to show us the truth. At the three o'clock, at about three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, "Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani?" I know I'm terrible at my um, my uh, my foreign language there, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? This is a quote from the Old Testament. He's calling back these scriptures, and he's saying that uh, not because he lost faith in God, because it was a reference made in the Old Testament, okay? Verse 47, some of the bystanders misunderstood and thought he was calling for the prophet Elijah. One of them ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, holding it up for him on a reed stick so he could drink. But the rest said, wait, let's see whether Elijah comes to save him. They just, they were so blind to the truth. Uh, Then Jesus shouted out again, and he released his spirit, verse 50. So this is the moment that Jesus died. He released his spirit. It goes to show that he had the power to uh, release his own spirit. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple, which we talked about in a minute, uh, a couple minutes ago, was torn in two from top to to bottom. The earth shook, rocks split apart, and the tombs opened. The bodies of many godly men and women who had died were raised from the dead. They left the cemetery after Je- Jesus' resurrection, went to the holy uh, city of Jerusalem, and appeared to many people. So these, these are the people that had died before, right? They had fed and found favor with God, and, and now they get to be risen from the dead, and they and their spirits, you know, walk through the holy uh, city of Jerusalem before they got to join uh, Jesus in heaven. The Roman officer and the other soldiers on the crucifixion were terrified by the earthquake and all that had happened. They said, this man truly was the Son of God. And many of the women who had come from Galilee with Jesus to take care of him were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, which is Jesus' mother, and the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee. As evening approached, Joseph, a rich man <coughs> from Arimathea, was, uh, had, who had become a follower of Jesus, went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. The Pi- and Pilate issued an order to release it to him. This was an odd request as well as a fulfillment of a request. Um, typically what happened was they, I hate to say this, this is grotesque, they would just throw the bodies in this giant ditch with all the other bodies and just eventually bury them. So the fact that they gave uh, Jesus this tomb, right, so to speak, and Joseph put him in this tomb, uh, was uh, um, was out of the ordinary. It's interesting how, also, uh, that the man, the rich man, his name is Joseph, who was Jesus' earthly father. So as Joseph quote-unquote, helped usher Jesus into this earth, uh, Joseph, a different Joseph, uh, took care of his body afterwards. Once again, there are no 
uh, mistakes in the Bible. There's so many references. Uh, Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a long sheet of clinen, uh, white, I'm sorry, clean linen cloth. Verse 60. Um, he placed on uh, he placed it in his own new tomb, which had been carved out of a rock. Then he rolled a great stone out of across the entrance and left. Both Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting across the tomb and watching. Uh, verse 62, the next day on the Sabbath, the leading priests and Pharisees went to see Pilate. They told him, sir, we remember uh, what that deceiver once said while he was still alive. After three days, I will rise from the dead. So that <clears throat> so we request that you seal the tomb until the third day. This will prevent his disciples from coming and stealing the body and then telling everyone he was raised from the dead. If that happens, we'll be worse off than we were at first. Obviously, they understood that if Jesus did indeed rise from the dead, uh, that would uh, not be good for their cause. And uh, even if the disciples uh, were somehow able to get the body and claim that Jesus had risen, uh, that would certainly uh, dispel all of their beliefs and their perspectives uh, about uh, things. So verse 65, uh, Pilate said, um, replied, take the guards and secure the best you can. So they seal the tomb and posted guards to protect it. So during those two days in between Friday and Sunday, they sealed the tomb to make sure Jesus could not escape. But more importantly, they didn't believe that Jesus was going to come back to life. Uh, they believed that the disciples would go and steal the body and claim that he had been resurrected. So obviously they, they took the precautions, whether it was the guards or the sealing of the tomb, to make sure that didn't happen. Only uh, it justifies even more right, our belief that Jesus rose from the dead. Have a sip of coffee, and we'll continue in uh, Matthew 28. <clears throat> now, early on Sunday morning, so we fast-track, <clears throat> excuse me, to Sunday morning, Matthew 28, verse 1, talking about the resurrection. Uh, early on uh, Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to visit the tomb. Suddenly there was a great earthquake. God moves the earth, right? For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. I love that that uh, kind of visual that, uh, yes, it wasn't just an earthquake. It wasn't that an earthquake came and, and, and the stone just happened to roll away. It's the fact that an angel moved the stone and then just sat on it, very casual, very leisurely, uh, uh, just kind of waiting for Mary's to show up. Um, and uh, I love that visual of an angel just sitting on top of the stone. What was trying to, what was meant to keep Jesus inside, right, was so trivial to the angel uh, that the fact that he can just, you know, move it aside and sit on top of it. All right, uh, his face shone like lightning, and his clothing was white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. So they passed out, so uh, kind of hid them away from what was about to happen. But they did see the angel and were so kind of uh, awestruck that they passed out. Uh, verse 5, then the angel spoke to the women, don't be afraid. Uh, I love the, the fact that the angel said, don't be afraid. I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to talk that much today. But the fact that uh, in the Bible, there's so many references of God telling us not to be afraid, not to be fearful, do not fear. Uh, you've seen that before. There's like 365 uh, references in the Bible to not being afraid. And I love the fact that that's the first words uh, that the angel said to the Marys. Hey, don't be afraid. I know you were looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Amen to that. Come, see where his body was lying. And now go quickly to tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. He is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I have told you. So he instructs the Marys to go, hey, you know what? Go tell the disciples Jesus is alive. He, you're going to see him over there. Amen to that. He is risen. And you know as, as Christians that we uh, use that phrase uh, every Easter uh, to, to kind of show our belief, the fact that what has changed and what's different about Christianity, what's different about following Jesus, is the fact that God came down here to save us, and he was not just a man. He died, and he rose just as he said he would. Verse 8, the women ran quickly from the tomb. They were very frightened. <laughs> they were very frightened, but they were also filled with great joy, uh, and they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. As and as they went, Jesus met them and greeted them. 
And they ran to him, grasp his feet, and worship him. Then Jesus said to them, Don't be afraid. There we go. Go tell my brothers to leave from Galilee, and they will see me there. So think about that. Within two paragraphs here, an angel and Jesus Christ instructs these women and also instructs us not to be afraid. Okay? Don't be afraid. Have no fear. Everything is going to be okay. Calm yourself. Jesus has this under control. Okay? Jesus has this under control. God has a plan. It's going to play out just as he said it would. Just like the, the, the angel said to the Marys, hey, Jesus said he was going to rise. He has risen just as he said he would. We've got to have faith in what God says. We have to eliminate that fear and that worry from our life and trust that Jesus is going to do what he said he was going to do. All right, we'll wrap up here. Verse 11, as the uh, women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and told the leading priest what had happened. A meeting with the elders was called, and they decided to give the soldiers a large bribe. They're freaking out, right? Uh, They are freaking out. The leading priests are freaking out that this is what they did not want to happen. All right, they told the soldiers, you must say Jesus' disciples came during the night while we were sleeping and stole his body. If the governor hears about it, we'll stand up for you so you won't get in trouble. So the guards accepted the bribe and said what they were told to say. The story spread widely among the Jews, and they still tell it today, which is interesting how he wraps up verse 15 with the fact that even today, (coughs) excuse me, even today, the Jewish people uh, have a belief that Jesus is not the Messiah, that Jesus did not come to uh, rise again. He did not take care of uh, everything he said he was going to do. The Great Commission. Then the 11 disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but somehow doubted. Some of them doubted. Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been giving you all authority of heaven and on earth. Therefore, go out and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey the commands I've given you and be sure of this. I am with you always to the end of the age. Okay, so Jesus gave them instructions, right, on what to do and what do the disciples need to do. They needed to go out. They had all the authority in heaven and earth, and they had to baptize them, baptize new people, bring them to the faith in the name of the Father, the Son, and and the Holy Spirit. So that's where that comes from. In case uh, you had been recently baptized, water baptized, and you're wondering where that phrase comes from, and the Trinity comes from, that's it, right? The end of Matthew, Jesus' words talks about the Trinity, talks about being baptized, and the Great Commission in the sense of we need to go out and tell the good news and bring people to the Lord. So if anybody ever questions you of, hey, you know, I don't understand, what's the Trinity? Where in the Bible does it talk about the, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Right there. We just talked about it. Right there. All right? All right, sip of coffee, and let's take a couple of questions. It's already 827 here in my time, so we got a couple minutes. <clears throat> let's dive into a couple of questions here and see what you guys uh, have today. Uh, all right, let's see. Anthony says this, and this is what I always like to read. The top question, I, you guys hear me say it every time, and even if it's a challenging one, I like to read it. Why are we not forced to abide by the Old Testament laws when Jesus said he hadn't come to supersede the prophets and Old Covenant? It is because he's a lamb and already fulfilled all sacrifice? You're, you're on the right path there. Jesus did talk about uh, uh, you know not having to uh, uh, abide by the Old Covenant, so to speak. What he said was he had fulfilled the laws. So Jesus had fulfilled the laws. Jesus had been the ultimate sacrifice. And it's not so much that we don't have to abide by the old laws, okay? Uh, let's, let's make that clear. Uh, we don't have to abide by the laws in order to get to heaven. Let's make that clear. In the in the Old Testament preaches obedience and work, right? You have to work and you have to do certain things in order to find favor with God. What Jesus did was said, hey, you guys aren't capable of that. We've seen that over and over again. So therefore, I will fulfill these laws and I will be the sacrifice for you. Okay? So now you go back to the Old Testament laws. Uh, they're kind of classified in two buckets. One would be the Mosaic laws or the, or the morality laws. 
as we call them, the ones from Moses, uh, like the Ten Commandments, for example. And the other ones are more uh, ceremonial laws. Uh, you can't eat shellfish, you can't trim your beard, uh, you can't uh, wear mixed fabric clothing, things like that. Uh, so those were different at the time. So you have to have a kind of distinction between those two sets of laws. Uh, so yes, we don't need to murder somebody or commit adultery, but we do that in honor of God, right? We abide by the Ten Commandments uh, because we love him and we're trying to be representations of him, uh, not in the way the Jewish people at the time were, where they were working and, and abiding by the moral laws, but also doing these ceremonial laws and Levitical laws to make sure that they found favor with God with the animal sacrifices and, and everything. We're just not, we just don't have to do that anymore because Jesus fulfilled that law for us. Okay, hopefully that answered your question. That's a, that could be an entire podcast episode on its own. Uh, all right. Let's see another sip of coffee. All right. Is uh, having a Jesus doll idolatry? No. Um, I, I, having a Jesus doll, which is interesting. But if you're having, a, if you have a figurine or something else, a painting, a picture of Jesus, I wear a cross around my neck, uh, right? I don't idolize this cross around my neck, this necklace. Uh, I don't worship uh, the cross around my neck. I wear it as a, as a remembering what Jesus did for me on that cross. So if you have a painting or picture of Jesus, a cross around your neck, or some other kind of symbolic uh, gesture there, uh, no, that's fine, of course. But what you don't want to do is turn something into an idol and worship those things. If it's taking the place of your relationship with Jesus, then that is idolatry, and that's what we need to um, uh, stay away from. That is for sure. All right, one more question, and then uh, we get out of here. Did Jesus, this is from Beck Girl, did Jesus die for everyone or just the elect? Great question, especially on this Easter weekend. To answer your question, I am of the belief that Jesus died for every single person on this planet. Now, saying that, there is always a but and a stipulation there. Jesus died for every single person. Every single person on this planet can join him in heaven and spend eternity with God. Period. However, you cannot reject God. You cannot reject Jesus. Okay? You have to accept his free gift. You have to accept God's grace, and you have to understand what Jesus did for you in order to join God in heaven for the rest of eternity. That's the reality. So uh, there's billions of people on this planet. If everybody understood that and accepted Jesus, read the story of what we just read, and understood what Jesus did for us and believed in Jesus in that way, uh, then yes, every single person on this planet would be saved. We don't um, get separated from God for eternity, and you can call that hell. Um, we don't do that because God sends us there or separates us. We choose that separation by rejecting Jesus, okay? So he will certainly open the door for us, but it's our job to walk through it. Uh, we can't slam the door in his face. If that's a weird analogy, but that's an analogy. <laughs> so that is the case, okay? So believe in Christ, uh, understand what he did for each and every one of us, and then there you go. Uh, you get to join him in heaven forever. All right, sip of coffee, and let's have a, a, a quick prayer for a good Friday. It's been a good Friday so far, and that was a good uh, episode. I appreciate you guys joining me today. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for bringing us together on this good Friday. But more importantly, we want to thank you for what you did on the cross so many years ago. Lord, we understand that it was not easy. We understand that you came down to this earth to save us from ourselves and to save us from decisions that we couldn't make on our own. We're such flawed human beings at times, Lord, that we don't even understand how to abide and follow. We get lost along the way, and you understood that we are failing people, and you had to come down and do the job yourself. And we're so thankful that you did. You provided a way, a path to heaven that we didn't, could not provide for ourselves. Today, Lord, I'm praying for those who are having doubts. I'm praying for people who don't quite understand or know the story 
of Easter. I pray that maybe they'll stumble into a church service on Sunday morning. Maybe they get invited by a neighbor. Maybe they just get curious about what this Easter thing is all about and go learn about the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ for themselves. I pray across this world, Lord, that pastors and preachers preach the good word and it changes people's hearts. I pray that we have a, a, a many, numerous, thousands, millions of new believers into the family of Christ after this weekend. Please give us the strength to invite a neighbor or a friend to church. Please give us the strength and the courage to tell them the story of Jesus. Help us spread the news as you commissioned those disciples so many years ago. Thank you so much for what you did. Thank you for the sacrifice that you did for us. Thank you for loving us more than we can possibly understand. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, that was a good one. Uh, we'll continue on Monday with a new episode, but thank you for uh, joining me for these Easter uh, podcast episodes. Uh, I love to read the Bible. I love to kind of talk about the good news and share the good news with everybody I can. So until next time, keep Jesus on your heart and forever on your mind. Have a great Easter weekend. Love you guys. Mm-hmm.